Now, now I can do it. Yeah, that's right. It's careful. It's recorded, John. Um, John's on the screen here and probably on the screen wherever you're at. John uh, is our West Gulf Division Director. He's a, uh, an elected board member. All of you can find folks elected him two or three or four times. No, probably twice now. And uh, uh, we really appreciate him coming to show up. He typically, he's our typical January speaker and starts off the year with an AWRL update and all kinds of good information. And I, I know from working through with him for the last two weeks, he, he slept a little bit. I got an email from him about 2.15 this morning. So, uh, John, hopefully you're uh, you're well slept last night. It's probably five or six hours of a good good number for you last night. But, John, go ahead. Thank you very much for showing up. Mark, I thought you were going to let me go to sleep this morning. <laughs> no, no sleeping in, baby. No, that's what we're um, Thanks for inviting me. I'm sorry I couldn't be up there with you, but uh, with the board meeting coming up next week, we just didn't have the time to drive up and meet with you. So we'll do it next time. But... Uh, you can ask any question about what the league is doing or not doing if, if you want. I believe what Mark wanted me to talk about principally was the legislation that we have filed at the end of December. Am I correct, Mark? Yeah, that's a good one. Yours. We filed, if, <clears throat> if most of you may remember, and some of you that are newer that don't, Although everyone in the world agrees that amateur radio saves lives, no one really disputes that. Although we've been around for a hundred years, the growth of amateur radio is being limited by the increasing creation of private, uh, well, let's call it residential de developments, whether for the plain unit developments, whether they are townhouses or single family subdivisions all of which carry with them private land use restrictions, sometimes called conditions, covenants, and restrictions that limit uses of that property. Private land use restrictions have been with us for what, 200 years at least. They have been used in the past for purposes that were not, or are no longer socially acceptable. All of those unacceptable uses were at one point or another removed by either state legislatures or federal legislatures, and they were all removed in the interest of the public good. <clears throat> if you know your history, there are folks in the room, including uh, my ancestors, who under these deed restrictions were, were prohibited from living in certain neighborhoods. People of certain religions have been prohibited from living in certain neighborhoods, national origin race. All of these have been stricken because they were not in the interest of the public good. But there are other lesser, if you want to call them lesser, restrictions. It's America. Most of us are proud to be Americans. But until 2005, it was not uncommon for cities, counties, and HOAs, private land use restrictions, to prohibit all of us from flying an American flag at our homes or at our businesses. In 2005, Congress had enough of that. And they passed what's known as the uh, Right to Display the American Flag Act. I think it's about two paragraphs long. It's very clear. No one may interfere with the right to display the American flag. By the way, that includes the right to put up a flagpole. Even after that bill was passed, it was not uncommon for homeowner associations to prohibit people from putting up a flagpole. I think there are at least five or six cases across the country that involve Medal of Honor winners who try to put up a flag and their HOA threatened to sue them. The HOA lost. But you would think that would not be something that would be considered a detriment to your neighbors, the detriment to the value of your homes, but yet it was in private land restrictions. It is now a national imperative to seek alternative energy sources, but it is not uncommon to find within the deed restrictions of many developments that the installation of solar panels is prohibited. I think California was the first state to pass a law that mandated that that was not enforceable. Florida was next. I think Texas was third. I know because we, uh, our amateur radio group, introduced that legislation along with a number of other groups. 
everyone talks about energy efficiency. HOAs have actually prohibited the installation of new and energy efficient roofs. Rainwater collection system, composting, xeriscaping. I mean, some HOAs prohibit or restrict you on the type of grass you can have. As odd as it would seem in the, in the most recent years of intense political activity across the country, a lot of HOAs until they were prohibited by state laws, prohibited you from putting up a, a political sign in your yard. In uh, Texas, we had to pass a law that would permit homeowners to install standby electric generators. It seems the HOA thought it was okay you were without power for four weeks after a hurricane, but we got the bill passed. Congress in 1996 stepped in to deal with another issue. After these homeowners, these subdivisions started being developed, and almost every subdivision in the country being developed, our plan unit development comes with these restrictions now. You are not uh, permitted to have a TV antenna. Now, we didn't have cable when I grew up, so we, we had antennas. There are companies that just figured out how to transmit video signals by satellite. You couldn't install a satellite dish. There are parts of the country that cannot receive or do not have cable to get uh, internet. So you had to get it over there. They prohibited antennas for that. So in 96, Congress, in amending the Communications Act of 1934, ordered the FCC to eliminate these restrictions. The result was what I referred to as the over-air reception device rules. 47 CFR, CFR 1.4000, it's called the OTAR rules, over the air reception device. All of these restrictions dealt with video programming, the receipt of video programming. Because they dealt with video programming, amateur radio was not included in, in these rules. But those rules eliminated all restrictions from CCNRs. If you want to put up a TV antenna on a mast, on a tower, that includes your own 25s, by the way. You don't have to ask for permission. You can put it up. If you want a satellite dish, you can put it up. You don't have to ask for permission. They can't tell you where to put it. They can't tell you to put it on the back of the house. They can't tell you to paint green or blue in some cases. And <clears throat> if you want to receive wireless internet, you can put it up or put up the antennas and you put them on a mast or a tower. Originally, you could only receive. Now the rules have been amended in, to permit retransmission since you can send internet signals back through satellites or through wireless internet, either one. But again, amateur radio is not included in those uh, OTAR rules. The league has tried for about 30 years to persuade the FCC to change the rules. In 1985, when the OTAR decision was made, which directed that all cities and counties would reasonably accommodate amateur radio and could not preemptively limit height or number of amateur radio installations, or particularly towers. We've been trying to get the FCC to extend that ruling to private land use restrictions. Each time we have requested it, the FCC has declined to do so. The position of the FCC is that they will do that when Congress tells them to do it. Okay, request understood. Now the request is being granted, or at least we're attempting to. We've been working, uh, starting in 2014, in the centennial year, the board that was in existence then introduced a bill into Congress called the Amateur Radio Parity Act, ARPA. Its intent was to obtain a congressional extension of PRB1 to private land use restrictions. It wasn't the best bill, but it was a bill. The bill was uh, reintroduced because by the way, Congress sits for two years at a time. If you file a bill, in this case, January starts the 118th congressional session, it will last for two years. If you file a bill today and it's not passed within two years, it dies, you have to refile it. Well, the bill was refiled more than once. In January 2016, it went to a hearing before a congressional committee. Unfortunately, sadly, however you want to look at it, the people running the bill for us and our sponsor insisted that the bill be changed. 
the resulting bill was essentially written by the HOAs. By the way, the National Association that represents these groups is called Community Association Institute, CAI. They're very good at what they do. They're very effective. Uh, last, let's see, 2021 and 2022, they're running two lobbyists out of Congress, which costs money, by the way. They're very aggressive in what they do. They don't believe in making any changes, whether it's rational or not. I mean, keep in mind, they opposed the right to display America flag. They opposed flagpoles. They opposed solar panels. They opposed rainwater collection systems. And in some subdivisions where we appeared on behalf of amateur radio operators, they really wanted to kick the amateur radio operators out of the neighborhood. Another story for another time. But that bill was so badly modified that had it passed, it would have effectively eliminate amateur radio across the country. If you want to get into details, we've got written analysis on the bill. We'll be happy to share them with you. But in 2019, the control of the board shifted and those who had been opposing what we viewed as the effort to sell amateur radio down the river, we directed our congressional sponsors to withdraw the bill. And it was withdrawn. We, the board then made a decision that we should continue with the effort in that we should draft better legislation and find sponsors to pass it. From 2019 to 2020, we were working on uh, a redraft of legislation that would be stronger and more effective for amateur radio. In 2020, the board passed what's known as Minute 51. When a board passes a resolution, it's not called a resolution, it's called a minute. I didn't create it, they did. But Minute 51 directed the Legislative Advocacy Committee to finish the draft of the bill and find a sponsor. And I'm chairman of the Legislative Advocacy Committee and have been privileged to be that for a couple of years now. There are other members right now of the committee and before we talk about the bills, let me tell you that you need to, if you get a chance, thank them for the efforts. This is not a one uh, horse shop. It takes the effort of multiple people on the board and the committee to do it. Uh, Tom Amanethi, W3TOM, who's now a retired Atlantic Division director, he just retired recently. The uh, former New England director, Fred Hopengarten, K1VR. And by the way, Fred is a uh, brilliant author, brilliant attorney. He is the author of the Antenna Zoning book that the league sells. And Fred is co-author of the bill with me. We can talk about that more in a minute. Lee Cooper, who's the West Coast Vice Director, W5LHC. Um, and we've also been privileged to have our FCC counsel, David Sedell, uh, K3ZJ, working with us on this. So all these folks have worked diligently to come up with a bill that will protect all of our interests. In the we have been searching for years since 2020 to find a sponsor. It's not difficult to find someone who will file a bill for you. That's not worth the paper it's printed on. What's important is to find someone in Congress who believes in what you are trying to do, who believes that the relief you're seeking is important and should be granted. Someone who will not just file it, but someone who intends to pass your bill. We were fortunate in the spring of 2022 to find such a sponsor. Congressman Bill Johnson, he is the uh, congressman for the eastern part of Ohio. He is a retired Lieutenant Air Force Colonel, spent 26 years in the Air Force, worked with Special Operations Command. He's been working, he and his staff, to whom we give a great deal of thanks as legislative director and his chief of staff have been working with us along with the congressman for the past year to come up with language that we as a group believe we can pass that grants the relief everyone wants to see <clears throat> the amount of work involved has been fairly intense like i said second a year we finally reached the uh language that uh, we think will work and by the way it's not just us if you file a bill in congress or you ask for legislation the bill will go through what's known as the uh, legislative council service the Senate has a version, the House has a version. Their responsibility is to put the bills into congressional format, make certain it doesn't violate any other laws. So we've been working with them too. We received the final draft of that language, I think on the morning of December 22nd, it was filed within hours. 
and we can talk about the details of the bill in a minute if uh, you've got time and you want to do that. Some people have asked, why did we file at the last minute? Because the moment we filed, it was never going to be grown into hearing <clears throat> and couldn't be passed in the 117th Congress. We filed it with deliberate intent. We have been speaking for years with multiple members of Congress who are interested in amateur radio and some who have actually sought us out and offered help and who have been interested in either supporting the bill or being co-sponsors. But mm, it's a little dangerous, if even if you're in Congress, to buy a pig and a poke. While they supported amateur radio and are interested in it, they did not want to sign on to legislation that they hadn't read. I think we all know that Congress has a history of passing bills they haven't read. The people who are interested in amateur radio did not want to sign on to a bill that they had not read. So by filing it in the last session, then it gives our sponsors the opportunity to read it, be comfortable with it. It also gave us the opportunity for to get the word out to, to all of our members so they could read it, make certain they're happy with it. It gave us a chance to let our uh, allies <clears throat> in the industry look at it and become comfortable with it. So that's the reason we filed it. We knew it wasn't going to be passed. But um, the congressman, when we met with him and the staff in September and with him personally in November, and by the way, it is not usual for small groups to be granted an audience with a congressman or a senator. The amount of time that they have is negative. If you meet with staff, you may get 15 or 30 minutes. It's not uncommon at the end of 15 or 30 minutes, everyone gets up and looks out. Their schedules are that tight. So if they take the time to meet with you, they believe it's important to do so, and they are interested in you and what you're doing. And the congressman took the time to meet with us personally. And <clears throat> he made clear he is committed to passing the bill. That doesn't mean we're not going to have opposition. We will. But importantly, we have a sponsor who wants to pass this bill. Actually, when we were in Congress in, uh, in D.C. in November, we had some other congressmen call our lobbyist and say, we want to meet with you. We want to talk to you <clears throat> because they said, we have active amateur radio operations in our state. We think it's important. We will probably pick them up as co-sponsors once the bill's refiled. It'll be refiled at sometime in the next week. So right now they're still picking chairman for the committees. They're picking members for the committee. It's not final. Once they get all the members selected for each committee, they've got to decide uh, who's going to be on committee staff, who's going to be on the particular congressman staff, and then they've got to set the schedule for the committee. So this is going to take a while. That's one reason Congress meets for two years. So that's, that is the primary bill. It's called H.R. 9670, House Resolution 9670. When it's refiled, it'll get another number. And we'll tell you what it is. We don't know what it is yet. <clears throat> There's another bill that was filed, H.R. 9664. That was filed by Debbie Lesko. She is a congresswoman out of Arizona. By the way, her husband is also an amateur radio operator. That bill was designed to deal with the FCC's lack of movement. The league has filed a number of petitions with the FCC to improve or modify our rights. One of them deals with the extension of technician privileges. One dealt with the removal of the symbol rate. The symbol rate application has been there since 2014. It's getting a little long on the tooth. We've met with Congress. David Sedell, I mentioned to you, RFCC counsel is a superb attorney. He was attorney to one of the commissioners on the FCC at one point. He's worked at the FCC. He's worked at Congress. He actually at one point was a lobbyist. If we wanted some of the representatives of the FCC, I don't think we could find anyone better. <clears throat> we've met with them, we've talked to them, we've pleaded with them. We're not having any success in getting any of these amateur radio matters uh, moved. So, okay, if we can't get the FCC to do it, we go to Congress. So Congresswoman Lesko agreed to file the bill. It's simple, it says to the FCC, you will remove the symbol rate, you will impose a 2.8 kilohertz bandwidth. We don't expect great, any opposition to it and it may result in the FCC actually moving that procedure, uh, that proceeding forward. It's up to FCC. Those are the two pieces of legislation, the most important of which, of course, is in terms of direct benefit to each of us in this audience, it's private land use legislation. And 
I can keep talking about this forever until uh, Mark and Mark have enough sense to mute my mic. But why don't I stop and let everyone else ask questions if you have any about what we're doing. Anything about Congress and how this is done. Uh, John, Tom Webb, WA non AFM. Yes, sir. Um, okay, we found uh, support in Congress. Uh, what support, if any, is there in the Senate? Two separate houses. That's not meant to be overly simplistic. We have not filed the bill in the Senate, and we won't. When we'll probably run it through the House first, get it passed, and then move it to the Senate, and then not only just move it to the Senate, we'll refile the Senate. The answer to the question was, what support do we have? Excellent support. We've got several senior senators, senior in terms of seniority, senior in terms of positions on critical committees that have been supporting us for some time. And those, the two senators I'm thinking about also have been working with us on another matter we can talk about, which is the attempt to eliminate amateur radio secondary rights on three gigahertz. We'll, we'll cover this and then we'll go to that because that's extremely important. It's very dangerous to us. But we they, they have all they have been sponsors of the previous bill the arpa bill it's our understanding they will support this bill but all this is a matter of procedure where do you, where do you start we're starting in the house but they are going beyond helping us with the bill they're helping us the FCC, uh, trying, attempting to help us with the fcc there's a and we'll skip ahead of one there's another piece of legislation we may file if any of you have been uh, following what the Forest Service has been doing in 2018, Congress passed the Farm Bill of 2018. Why does the Farm Bill affect amateur radio? Because Congress told the US Forest Service to start recovering costs for administering communications facilities in national forests. AT&T, Verizon, radio broadcasters, and amateur radio have installations in, Amphen in National Forest. Forest Service held a notice of parole's rulemaking in December of 2021. In it, they proposed to impose a $1,400 per year fee on every communications installation. That will wipe out almost every amateur radio installation in the country. If the league filed opposition to it, the Forest Service hasn't made a ruling yet. We talked to the uh, chairwoman of the Senate uh, Agriculture Committee, uh, now retiring Senator St uh, Stubbenow, and the, her staff, uh, and she asked the Forest Service not to impose the fee on amateur radio. The last we heard, there had been no response from the Forest Service to the chairwoman of the committee. You need to think about that. She's the chairman of the committee that determines what your agency does and they didn't respond to her. <clears throat> Senator Lujan out of New Mexico on that committee, in fact, the entire New Mexico delegation, sent a letter to the, FCC, uh, to the Forest Service saying, do not impose an amateur radio. The entire delegation, Democrat and Republican, and Idaho did the same thing, do not impose it. I believe there are a number of state officials out of Michigan who also sent letters. So far, there's been no response. So if that fee is imposed on amateur radio, we will be filing a bill in Congress to remove that fee against amateur radio. Now let me stop and go back to, we'll talk about, um, I believe your question, Tom, was about the Senate. We're in good position in the Senate right now. Though when ARPA went through the Senate last time, <clears throat> it was stopped principally by Senator Nelson out of Florida. He's no longer there, but he wasn't actually alone. There were some other senators who were standing with him to prevent the passage of an amateur radio bill. They are still there. So it's not, this is not a free walk on the park. But the senators that are behind us, the ones last time, Senator Wicker was one of our strong sponsors. Senator Blumenthal was a strong sponsor. We expect that they uh, will be so in the future. They have been very, very active on our behalf uh, with the FCC. We're very proud of having both of them as our sponsors. We're fortunate to have both of them as sponsors. Did I ask, answer that question well enough, Tom? Uh, yes, as a follow up, uh, in terms of the House, what can we do or not do locally to uh, help move this along? When we refile the bill, 
uh, give us a couple of weeks. At that point, once it's official, we have the new bill number. We will also know who the co-sponsors are. We, we're talking, this is a bipartisan bill. ARPA was a bipartisan bill. This is not a Democrat bill. It's not a Republican bill. It's, there's no politics to this. So when we refile, we'll have sponsors on both sides of the aisle. Once that is refiled, then we're going to send the word out to the membership. And that's when we want the membership to start contacting their particular congressman, going, would you please either support it, vote for it, or co-sign it. Once the bill is filed, if um, Mark, Mark, and Tom and I are the sponsors of the bill, Dwayne, Peter can sign up after the bill is filed as co-sponsors. More co-sponsors, more people committed to the past. The other thing that is helpful, <clears throat> will be helpful, besides contacting your congressman, and probably more than one time, will be to consider making a donation. This, we've got a lobbyist. Uh, they actually think they know what they're doing, and they think we ought to pay them, which we can be on a regular basis. They're, they're good, by the way. Uh, we're tickled to have them. They're, they've been successful in finding sponsors for us. We pay them regularly. If you go to Washington, which we have to do on a fairly regular basis to meet with staff and congressmen, our senators, you might as well go to London or Paris. It's about that expensive. You can pick a hotel room that will cost you $200 a night. And on Monday, a week from Monday, it will be $699 a night. It just depends on what's going on in Washington. <clears throat> We've got those expenses. We've got, uh, we will have expenses in terms of getting uh, support, getting information out to members. We have money in the budget. Uh, in fact, in the next week, the board meets on the 20th and 21st, those official meeting days. The committees will meet next Thursday. And one of the items that occurs in every January is the approval of the operating budget for the next year. And one of the items in the budget is approval of the funds for the legislative efforts. Even though we have the money in the budget, we allocated it, <clears throat> it's always helpful to have donations that go toward that so we don't have to spend operational funds for this. We created, when ARPA was alive, a legislative advocacy fund that was extremely beneficial in covering the cost of going to DC and meeting with folks. So it, it, if you remember in some of the previous political campaigns over the last what, eight years, Money was raised at $2, $3, $5, $10. Even small contributions add up. I mean, we were joking the other day that if every one of our members were to buy a hamburger and donate that money instead to the league, I bought a Big Mac market for $5.99. If everyone did that, it would completely cover our costs with the extra. So do not send hamburgers to headquarters, by the way. The refrigerators are too small. So it, there, there are two principal things. One is when we call you, talk to you, you can probably email. If you send a letter, it goes to a particular facility in uh, Maryland to be processed for uh, anthrax, all sorts of other things. It takes six weeks plus to get a letter to a congressman. Or if you call, they record every call you make. If you're a constituent, and you call Senator Klein, they note you are a constituent. If you're not a constituent, they'll note it anyway. But the strongest support, they, the people to whom they look are constituents because you vote. You also can make donations to their campaign. You're important. It's not that they don't have any respect for others. It's just people up there run for Congress or the Senate because they think they can do something good. But in order to get there, they need two things, money and votes. So constituents calling in count. You don't have to call. You can send an email. We'll give you the address to send emails. We may, as we do with ARPA, uh, actually let you print out uh, or sign up for a letter, and we'll print the letters and deliver them. We can hand deliver letters to a congressional office, and they don't go through an anthrax facility. And until they get enough sense to keep our lobbyists and us out of Congress, we're, we can hang deliver. 
So that's where we'll, we'll go. We'll ask you for help. It was very, very effective last time. You would think that I'm the guy sitting in the back of this room listening to this. What difference does it make whether I send a letter or make a phone call? It makes all the difference in the world. Elections recently have been cited by 10 votes, 20 votes, 30, 50 votes. Every voice counts. So you may think you're just the guy or the girl in the back of the room. You're not. You're the guy and the girl in the back of the room who may make a difference. It, it counts. Um, I'll give you a short example. Some of you've heard it before. I ran the legislative program in Texas. We were having problem with a committee in one year. There were 27, I think, what they called wireless communication device bills. Translate them as cell bills. They were identical. Had they passed any one of them, it would eliminate the operation of mobile amateur radio in the state of Texas. In the previous session, we had persuaded a Senate committee to, to acquire that language favorable to amateur radio be included in those bills. Next session, when they refiled, they ignored the Senate directive. We had been attempting to meet with the chairman of the members of that committee to ask them to include the language. Had no success. So David Woolley was, was uh, director of the time, I was vice director. On Thursday afternoon, before the, I believe it was Monday hearing, we sent an email out to the entire, uh, all three sections in Texas, and asked everyone to send either a fax, which gave everyone the language, or to make a phone call with the message. Please call these committee members and the chairman's office and ask them to include the language. Everybody did. We went down to the chairman's office. I think it was Monday morning or Tuesday morning. When the hearing's going to be held? We walked into the chairman's office and the phones were ringing and everybody was busy running around. There's this tall, very lovely lady in the back holding a sheaf of papers about an inch and a half there. We asked to speak to the chief of staff. She was the chief of staff. When she heard we were the amateur radio, she walked across the room with purpose, stopped in front of us and waved those papers. She said, these are yours. And those phones ring in the background, they're yours. Tell your people the chairman got the message. No bill will pass out of this committee without your language. Okay, that was the fun part. But we walked out in the hallway to go see some other people, and we had people running up to us going, Would you please ask your people to stop making phone calls? Short version is so many of our people called in and sent faxes that they overloaded the phone system at the Capitol. They shut it down. The point is that can be done anytime, anywhere, if you want to do it. I don't think you shut down the congressional phone system by the way, it's, it's pretty robust. The point is your voice carries, whether it's in an email, it's a telephone call, you can make the difference. And the last time, remember this, the ARPA bill passed the house twice by voice vote. It got killed in the Senate. So we have good hope we can do it again. Long-winded way of answering questions, but I hope I've made it clear that everyone sitting here has the ability to help us pass this bill. And if you make a contribution, if you decide to send one in, be sure to mark it as legislative advocacy fund, because that means it's earmarked. It can't be spent for hamburgers in the cafeteria. It can only be spent for what we're doing. Yep. Other questions? Those are good questions, Tom. Are you challenging us not to uh, take down the phone system? Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Say again. Are you challenging us not to take down the phone system? It's a judge. So the, the, your question is coming through and it's a little muddy. Try again. So I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, are you challenging us not to take down the phone system? Because we could probably do it. Well, I'm not telling you not to. Uh, <laughs> hey, trust me, when the phone system goes down, you have everyone's undivided attention. Because no one can talk, no one can sense anything. So, yeah. Anybody have a question in the room? If we take down the phone system, maybe they need the radio. Yeah, that's true. If we take down the phone system, our hand is the radio. We're getting out of trouble. Any questions? Nothing here. Wait, you got one coming for you. Hold on. Can you say any more about the, is it 300 gigahertz uh, legislation? Uh, yes, three gigahertz. 
if you have a cell phone in your pocket and you do, or it's on the table, the use of those is growing dramatically worldwide. It's like standing everyone trying to go through a door at one time. The bandwidth's not enough to let the entire group to go through. Same thing with cell signals, which the best evidence of that is whenever there's an emergency or a uh, weather event, the cell system goes down because it gets overloaded. The cell companies make a lot of money off all of us carrying these little devices. They want more frequency. Guess who's got it? The United States military and us. We're secondary, almost everything about three. And primary is the United States military. And the rules are simple. We can use it anytime we want to, provided we don't interfere with the United States military, which has worked out for what, 60, 70 years? Well, <clears throat> Congress has authorized, or has authorized once and is trying to authorize again, the FCC to sell part of the three gigahertz band. They authorized them to sell three, four, five to five. They did. Moving the military off primary and putting the cell companies in as primary. Okay, what difference does it make to us? We can still remain secondary as long as we don't interfere. The FCC removed our secondary status. We objected to that in writing. Their explanation of why they did not retain us on secondary status, you can read it, it's published, it's a little inconsistent. In Hawaii and Alaska, they're not auctioning off 3455, and they don't propose to auction off the other frequencies either when they get permission to do so. They still took us off secondary status in Hawaii and Alaska. And if you think Alaska is not amused, you understating their lack of interest in this. <clears throat> well, there is a bill that came through the House. It's passed the House, it's down the Senate. Well, both of them are being refiled, by the way. It grants the FCC the authority to auction from three, three to three, four, five. <coughs> We have been at the FCC, we're not going to win that argument, but we've been at Congress asking the committees that are dealing with that to amend the bills to put a provision in says amateur radio will retain secondary status or to put it in the committee report. The difference is if it's in the bill, it's law. If it's in the report, it's a recommendation. <clears throat> I mentioned our two strong senators, Senator Worker and Senator Blumenthal. They've been working diligently to see that one of those two happens. The passage of legislation is, is a remarkably complex and dynamic matter on any subject. On this subject, it's very involved. There are multiple interests. The House bill passed. The Senate has declined to accept the House bill. They don't like what it says. There are <clears throat> a group of key senators on the key committee that has to pass the bill who don't even agree amongst themselves. They're all doing what they think is right, trying to come up with a bill that's in the interest of what they think is the country, but there's disagreement, so it's held it up. So instead of passing in the last session, it's gonna come back up for consideration again, which gives us the chance to try and hold secondary status. Why do we care? Besides the obvious, we've never been removed to my knowledge, and I'd have to talk to David Sedell, we should certainly, on secondary status before. The military has asked us to move, which we've done. But if we can be kicked off secondary status on three, uh, three to three, five, let's well, stop them from kicking off secondary status on any other frequency. There is, there is an interest right now in reassigning it to use the 10 gigahertz. If you remember, the French tried to take over two meters a few years ago. They were crushed, but it doesn't mean they're going to stop. Not necessarily French will try. But if there are only so many frequencies in the world, it's kind of like real estate, Will Rogers said, they're not making any more of it. So there will be always an interest in taking that which someone else has. So we've now, we have not introduced legislation on the subject because there's pending legislation. Our effort is to engraft ourselves into that legislation. So that's the fight. And we've been at it since I think it started <clears throat> last summer.
John, we have another question for you. Sure. Uh, good morning, John. Lee Greenleaf, W5HLG, we talked last year about Aries in your year. Uh, I've been following every uh, meeting that you guys have been having since I can get the minutes of the executive meeting. And I wanted to say, it, can you expand on where Aries is headed, especially in its interaction with online security and FEMA? Okay, if I, the, the phone's a little, the sound's a little weak. You're talking about Aries. Aries and field service, section managers, SECs, all that come under a new standing committee called the Emergency Communications Field Service Committee. That committee was created at uh, my request and a number of other board members back in, it was officially formed in July of 2021. It survived three attempts to kill it. Those who do not want a committee focused on ARIES, NTS, and field service. That committee's charge is to look at ARIES itself as a separate operating program and see what we can do to enhance it. There is a report coming out as part of the ECFAC report to the board this next week. I'm not on that subcommittee, so I can't give you details of what the report says, but I can tell you what the interest of the committee is, and that is to bring support into the field, ARIES, NTS, and section managers that doesn't exist. Now, Mark Klein, as section manager for Oklahoma, is a member of a working group. I had the subcommittee that has been charged with looking at the reorganization of field service, which would incorporate areas into it. The purpose of reorganizing is to make it work better and get support for the section managers. Mark, who do you report to legally? Uh, uh, technically nobody. No. If I heard you, you don't report, you don't have any authority over you. I have none, yes. That's been the intent of um, the league for what over 100 years, I think. Section managers are elected by everyone in this room, and they don't have any direct uh, oversight. In Mark's case, doesn't matter. He does an excellent job. He's innovative. You've got a great section. We've got three good section managers in Texas. That's not true everywhere else in the country. There are people who get elected who do not have the talent, the vision, the drive of the West Coast section managers. Part of their problem is they don't have enough support from headquarters. But in terms of, you know, think everyone's got a boss, the boss for the section manager of the people sitting in this room. If Mark needs help with something, there's no, he has no legal basis to ask me for that help. And even though I'm division director, I have no direct ability to grant, except on a personal basis, that help. Now, within the West Gulf, we're an operating unit. Four section managers work with Lee Cooper and myself. It's, it's a group effort. We don't have a problem. That's not necessarily true in other divisions. It just it doesn't work as well. So the idea was to, and this is this will come up before the board meeting. There are two proposals that will come up. I think there will be two proposals. This question of how do we alter this to get support for the section managers? Those two versions have been discussed. If you read the minutes of the EC FSC committee, in addition to the EC committee, EC executive committee, EC FSC executive or emerging communications committee, you'll see these matters discussed in those in those minutes. And that, that will maybe a very hot topic at the board meeting because they're two different fields of thought. Uh, one of which is the section manager remain independent to become an operating unit with the directors. Another uh, field of thought is the section managers are transferred to uh, working directly under headquarters. The board will make that final decision. There's been a lot of disagreement over it. And I know if I answered your question well enough on the Aries, but part of that on Aries there are there was an Aries 2.0, I think, uh, manual put out. They are working on an improvement to that. Uh, there is the subcommittee is working on how to grow Aries and get more support. FEMA likes amateur radio. There are memorandums of understanding between the league and <clears throat> Red Cross, National Weather Service, and FEMA. 
The last one with FEMA was dated 2014, done in the Centennial. The uh, FEMA came back to us, I want to say last early, late last summer, early fall, and said, why don't we renew it because it's expired? The proposal was to extend it for one year. It took us several weeks to rewrite that MOU. The previous one was not very good. I think it went from two, three pages to like eight pages. When we sent it to FEMA, they were so excited over the change and what we're proposing that they asked if they could make a big change in it. They asked if they could extend it from one year to I think five years. FEMA likes amateur radio. We've met with them uh, uh, in meetings in, in DC. They believe that we are an important component of emergency response. So the question is, how do we strengthen areas? How do we get more support into the field? There are a number of proposals out of ECFSC that I don't think will be acted on at this board meeting, but they are on a list. I think there's, I think Lou Cooper has been keeping that list. We've got about 50 things to do and a significant proportion of those is how do we bring more support to areas? So a lot of what happens with areas will be in the future because we're trying, we're having to reorganize so much because for decades, Aries was not a high point of interest at headquarters. We're trying to change that. More questions? John, Tom Webb again. Uh, is there any movement to uh, have 60 meters opened up to just broad spectrum or do, are, are we still stuck with channelized uh, service? Uh, I laugh because uh, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. Presently, we have those channels. Presently, we've allowed 100 watts. NTIA, which is the coordinating body for the federal government for the use of all frequencies, has a different version of this. There is a proposal that will impose a maximum of nine watts radiated power or amateur radio on 60 meters. There are also proposals, I think, to take away some of the channels. That hasn't gone anywhere yet. We're proposing it. It's been kind of languishing in the background, fortunately. There was a counter proposal that we would increase the amount of power we could use on 60. That is not going to go anywhere. Uh, we're trying to hold at 100. If you want to ask why they want us at nine watts, the official version is it's in the best interest of the uh, use of the band. The uh, retiring Atlantic director, Tom Abernathy and I were at a luncheon in DC and we had someone from NTI who will remain anonymous for this discussion. And we had Tom and I asked the question, why are you trying to reduce it to nine watts radiated power? Because that means we're not gonna be able to talk to our neighbors. And 60 meters, as we all know, is extremely effective. And it works well around the world. He hedged for a good part of the conversation. And finally, we kept pushing. And said, we said, look, we're not interfering with anybody. We're, we're responsible in the use of it. He said, you are. But he said, you've got some rogues who are showing up, running, what is obviously not 100 watts. He said, we don't know exactly what they're running, but it's not anywhere close to 100. It may be close to over uh, 1,000 watts. He said, when they do that, they wipe out everyone else. He said, you're not supposed to be primary, guys. So we kept pushing. And he said, let me put it another way. He said, you're not the only users of that frequency. And yes, it works superbly well around the world. And there are people with whom we do not want you to interfere. At that point, the question was, would any of these people have initials that have only three letters? <laughs> there was a large granny went, I am not going to answer that question. So what we suspect is that the frequencies being used by uh, the military and intelligence operations. And they are in parts of the world where they really need to get a signal out. 
and that as sensitive it is we've, that there's interference from amateur radio, not intentional. No one in this room has done it. But they want us out of the way because it's being used <clears throat> for matters that involve life and death. Speculation, they didn't say that. So expansion, I don't think so. We've managed to hold our own for the moment, but NTIA and others are not backing off. Hopefully we can keep them from closing nine and keep what we've got. Other questions? John, you want to talk a little bit about uh, volunteer on the air or you want me to do it later? Or what? No. You want to start? You want me to start? I'll go ahead. I'm going to blame it all on you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, you're right. <laughs> but if your meeting goes the right way, it might be even worse than that. Yeah. Go ahead. Does everyone in the room know what uh, volunteers on the air is? And I can't see you, so Mark, and Mark, you're going to have to tell me how many people raise their hands. Your hands and you know, volunteers on the uh, well, Mike does. Uh, this probably doesn't someone up here, someone on the on their, um, volunteers on the the, the CEO, a minister, declared uh, as part of oper operation headquarters that the year 2023 would be the year of the volunteer. Okay, neat. The bands will be improving, sunspots are getting better. Well, as part of that, there was a discussion well over a year ago about starting an operating event because I was meeting PSC trying to get it done. It's morphed into now what's been called volunteers on the air. If you remember in 2014, we ran an operating event where W1EW slash Phil and Mike rotated across the country. People were given permission to operate as W1EW slash portable 543. And it was an extremely popular event. When you got up in the air, if you talk to Mark, or you talk to me, or Lee, or anyone else who has a volunteer position in the league, you would get points. And it was an effort to see who got the most points and who won. Now, if you talk to Mark, you got negative points. If you talk to me, you got positive points. <laughs> it was very popular. <clears throat> and that, so it's a, a version of, again, W1AW slash is going to walk across the country. It will be in each state twice during a year for a week, starting on a Wednesday night, entering on uh, Tuesday night. That's the idea. And it was supposed to be set up so that each state would end up with coordinators, end up with volunteers to operate in time slots. You can operate on any band. Uh, I'm sorry, on any band except the work bands at 630 meters and on any mode. Okay, simple, right? If you look around the room and realize that not everyone's hand went up, you're looking at the problem. This was the decision to do this was made in the spring, summer. Programs and Services Committee is in charge of these matters. They uh, decided to do it. They told headquarters, this is what we need to get done. Go get it done. The first notice that really went out to the members was the January QST, two pages. If you look, to the link that was given to you on the second page, the link went to a blank web page. So it wasn't organized well, and I apologize. It's not the director's fault or it's not the section manager's fault. As much fun as I have blaming stuff on Mark, it wasn't organized. We're scrambling to get it organized. <clears throat> the first two states were supposed to start in the first two weeks of January. I think, I know Virginia dropped out because they had no notice they couldn't get it organized. Mark has done an excellent job of getting it organized for Oklahoma. He's just, he is the uh, coordinator for Oklahoma. Steve Smith, North Texas Sex Manager Coordinator for Texas. Mark has developed a sign-up sheet that is probably the best one in the country. In fact, as soon as we later today confirm that it's stable to his satisfaction, I've already told the rest of the board that we're going to loan that out to the rest of the country because uh, a lot of the sign up programs are not very good. But and what Mark, if I get this wrong, everyone, anyone who wants to apply can contact Mark, go online to the sign up sheet, sign up for a two hour block on a band for a mode. But you can't do it well in any. You've got to uh, get a final approval from Mark. There's a rumor that Mark is asking for money, but I don't know anything about that. <laughs> 
the uh the, if you on the page that mark's got and he i think you've already released it mark to the division or to the right. section you know <clears throat> but if you go to that it lists out the points that you can get for talking to anyone it also lists out all the important people in oklahoma and the points beside their name i believe if you look at that point chart it's not what we would prefer. Uh, I've been talking to Mike Ritz, who is chairman of the Program Services Committee. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if we can change that point list. It wasn't drafted by PSC. It's the old 2014 list. We're going to, I believe Mark intends to, Mark, I'm sorry, uh, Mike intends to bring it up at the uh, PSC meeting next week to see if we can alter the points. You'll note that employees at headquarters have more point value than people in the field. It's my personal opinion that everyone in the field is more important than the employees. I mean, if you look at life members, life members worth two points. I'm sorry, people who are life members put up a lot of money to be a life member. They're truly dedicated to the league. They ought to be worth more than two points. And really, Mark ought to be worth more than negative 100 points. But <laughs> so. It's, it's just beginning to pick up steam, even though it's not as well organized. It will be organized probably within a month. Um, Oklahoma's on the 25th, starts on the 25th, Mark. Right. right. Which means there'll be Oklahoma stations uh, subject to Mark getting them signed up. They'll be operating as W1AW slash <clears> five. <throat> right now, if you talk to any one of the portable stations, it's worth five points. And we're suggesting it'd be worth more than five points. Texas starts on February 1st, and Steve Smith out of North Texas is organizing that. But the other states are beginning to get organized, so it should be as big a deal as it was in 2014. Um, we will have better sunspots, so that we get good activity on it. And again, um, North Texas, or Steve will have a list of all the people in Texas and points by them. The other division directors and section managers will be doing the same thing. It'll be set up across the country. You have to use Logbook of the World to record your uh, contacts. So if you don't have an account, contact headquarters, get one. And it's supposed to automatically add the points into uh, your account. Yeah. The, leader, the leaderboard that should have been up months ago is not up yet. It's on my screen. You forgot to have the little guy with the shovel, the animated shovel, like it's 1992. <laughs> You're right. The uh, and I am a I am a life member. So am I. <laughs> so, um, and it's Mark, embarrassing. Uh, we agree. So it should. Twenty fourteen was hugely powerful. We think we'll be again once we get it set up and running. Um, <clears throat> there are people already operating. Uh, are making contacts on, under volunteers in the air. They're not necessarily contacting W one W stations because they're not up. But they're contacting each other. It's it should be a good event, and we may we don't we don't have time yet. But when uh, particularly when Texas rolls around, we did it the last time, uh, and, I, and Mark can do this if you want to. We would put a number of people in the room with badges. So if you hit one station, you would pick up five six people, you get all the points at one time. But that's the event. Uh, yes, and, it, and we'll talk about it later here, um, but uh, appreciate the uh, overview. Anybody else have any further questions or follow-up online or in person? It's quiet here. That's a good deal. Anything else, John, that you wish to add that you want to go on? Mark, you know better. Yes, you're asking an employer who makes his living hard. talking if he wants to keep talking. I mean, that's dangerous. No, uh, I think we've covered the, the important topics. The board meeting is next week. Any number of things may and will happen. Uh, I'd be happy to come back and tell you what the board did or didn't do. Okay, we got one more question here. I yes. not a question, it's a comment. Uh, I had occasion to contact uh, ARRL, uh, WAS, and uh, DFCC. Uh, it was uh, a whole complete turnaround from the past. The people were so friendly, courteous, and cooperative. And I think some kudos need to go to uh, whoever's helping to 
the street accord. We've been making a good effort <clears throat> trying to get uh, the new CEO to do it, <clears throat> making an effort to, to see to it that when members call, they get a, a quick response and that people are, have a better attitude. And that's been paying off. We've got some, we've got some people up there that have been there a long time. They enjoy it. And those are the ones you're talking to. They're, they will be very helpful. And I, I'll pass the word on that. <clears throat> Somebody said nice things. <laughs> Yeah, fire that person. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't possible. But um, no, I, I, I think I said in the beginning, but let me make clear that Mark's doing an excellent job as such a man. Uh, he is that working group in order to determine how we would reorganize field service. Since I was chairman, I recommended that we form a group of section managers. Since we're talking about revitalizing or changing field service, we thought it kind of important to ask the people whose lives we're going to affect. Mark is one of the 12 on that working group and his input has been extremely valuable. I interrupted Mark or you or somebody else. Uh, no, I was going to say the checks in the mail is what I've been saying. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, Mark's check asking me to say that clear, by the way. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> if you've got questions about anything, you my email is n5aus at n5aus.com. If you go to QST, uh, my phone number is listed there. So if you've got questions, call. If, it's a, if you want to complain, call Mark. If you want to say something good, call me. <laughs> Works that way every day. Thank you very much. It Mark. does. But I appreciate you taking time on a Saturday morning to let me come and talk to you. But again, if you've got questions, uh, yell at us. Watch for us sometime, probably in this January, February. We'll be coming back asking for help on the legislation. It gives us a chance to alter the future. And you're going to be a key part of that. Thanks again. Let's thank John for being here this morning. Thank you, Thank you, John. We appreciate you. And you want to save meeting or not, or go to sleep. Your choice.